Hello, I'm Rachel Henderson, a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for being with us. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive opportunities to network with guests and preference when applying for our internship assistance or for paid student positions at the Institute. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Our past and future programs are available to watch on video on our website. We'd like to encourage each of you to consider becoming friends of the Dole Institute. Do so by returning the brochure on your chair at the end of tonight's program. Our friends help keep our programs free and open and, su and support archive research and our student activities. I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have time for questions and answers. If you have a question, raise your hand and a student helper will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. Hearing assistance is available and we have a loop section at each program designated by a sign. If you have any questions about the loop or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers here in the hall and they can assist. And now, please welcome Jack Martin, the Director of Strategic Communications at the University of Kansas. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be here with you tonight to introduce this conversation with Ivan Vedova. And I want to thank the Dole Institute and KU Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies for making this evening possible. Our guest tonight could very well be considered an expert on Eastern Europe simply by virtue of his family tree, as being the child of parents for whom the pan-Slavic idea was represented in their very union. Or consider an expert by his biography, having been born in Belgrade, the son of a Yugoslav diplomat, whose postings took Ivan and his family all throughout Europe and beyond. Ivan then completed his education in Paris and returned to the country of his birth, a country which no longer appears on our maps. But he most certainly can be considered an expert on Eastern Europe and on civil society and democracy based on his career as an activist, an author, an advisor, and an advocate, helping the nations of the region build the institutions and norms needed to be truly free and democratic. This work was difficult and it was not without risk to his own safety and to the safety of other pro-reform leaders. It is also work that is ongoing, requiring constant vigilance as progress can be halted or even reversed, as we've unfortunately seen in many nations in the region. However, Ivan has worked to continue that progress throughout his career. He was a key figure in the democratic opposition movement in Yugoslavia, was executive director of the Belgrade-based Fund for an Open Society, and a senior foreign policy advisor to two Serbian prime ministers before joining the German Marshall Fund of the United States in 2003, when he is currently the senior vice president for programs. But rather than give you his biography, as there really isn't time for that uh, this evening, given its length, I want to share why I was so interested in uh, having him come visit us at the University of Kansas. Now, when I was growing up, I watched a lot of CNN. I was an odd child. Um, <laughs> and much of the news at that time was about the breakup of Yugoslavia. And so that region has held a special interest for me ever since. And I met Yvonne last year when the German Marshall Fund held its inaugural transatlantic leadership seminar in the Balkans, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, and Serbia. And he introduced our group to journalists and elected officials, to democracy activists, business leaders, and those fighting corruption in those countries. But more importantly, he reminded all of us of the great personal costs that the struggle for free and open societies often entail. And whether it was the assassination of Serbia's pro-reform prime minister, Zoran Djindjic, for whom Ivan was a senior foreign policy advisor, or the horrors of Srebrenica, a place where we walked among thousands of tombstones, and uh, including one for a boy who was the same age that I was when I was watching all this unfold on CNN. 
the insights he provided during that experience have shaped and expanded my thinking about the region and about what it takes to both establish and protect free, open, and democratic societies. I hope his comments tonight will do the same for you. Please join me in welcoming Ivan Vedova for his conversation with Bill Lacey, director of the Dole Institute of Politics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Yvonne, it's great to have you here. Can you um, start by telling us a little bit about your upbringing and your education? Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jack, for your very kind words. It's always difficult to listen about oneself, and you realize that <laughs> you've done a lot, even though it doesn't feel like that at this moment. And thank you to the Dole Institute and to the university that really greeted me with great warm open eyes this morning. Um, I, I grew up, as, as Jack said, as a child of a, of a diplomat of a country called Yugoslavia that no longer exists. And um, it was a country that had freed itself uh, from uh, Nazi and fascist occupation in a national liberation war and uh, that ended up not being fortunately behind the Iron Curtain. Um, there was a break between the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia in 1948 and it maintained its uh, independent status vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet bloc and the Warsaw Pact. And uh, although it was a communist country, it um, was much freer. We could travel freely. Um, my parents sent us to English-speaking schools. There were no constraints of that sort. So I grew up abroad, most of my childhood and adolescence in Brazil, Czechoslovakia, Great Britain, uh, Italy, and, and Paris. And as Jack mentioned, I was lucky my father's last posting was in Paris where I studied political science. And I came of age, and uh, I like to stress this because these, these are important formative moments for me. The year was 1968, um, and I just finished high school, and two, two events really, really shaped uh, my, uh, my political coming of age. One was, of course, the student movement, the 60s, the civil rights movement that we were following in the US, but obviously the, the events in Paris. Uh, where um, you know the, the the new generation had uh, stood up for a lot of its rights, and with that student movement, it was not simply a student movement. There were all the the new movements. The the women's movement was reborn, a movement for rights of a variety of minority groups, uh, the whole climate and environmental issue. So it was really a, a broader movement. The other important event, and I found myself in Belgrade that summer in August was the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, on August 21st. And I found myself in, the, in front of the embassy of Czechoslovakia, where some of you may know Madeleine Albright spent a few years while her father was the ambassador, and actually my father knew her, ambassador, uh, her father very well, uh, Mr. Korb. And I saw thousands of stranded Czechoslovak tourists not knowing what to do with the Soviet tanks on their territory, and for me, um, this was something that was absolutely unacceptable. The invasion of a foreign country, the incursion and taking away the sovereignty of that country. And basically all my life and activity, whether academic or, or my engaged life, was for, for freedom and, and democracy. That, even for an 18-year-old that I was, that was something terrible that, you know, a, a Czechoslovak nation that rose to basically do what Yugoslavia did in 1948, 20 years uh, prior to make itself freer from the Soviet bloc, uh, was not allowed to do that by the, the terrible force of a, of a, of a military, uh, of a literally of a military invasion. And basically, night fell over Czechoslovakia for, for so many years. And then courageous people, like Václav Havel, uh, started a movement, Charter 77, the, the dissidents throughout Eastern Europe, uh, against all odds, in the most adverse of circumstances, started car carving out what were called oases of civil society. And oases meant five people, ten people, fifteen people. And a lot of the people, and I had the fortune to have several conversations with President Havel, with the Polish dissidents like Adam Michnik, or in Hungary like George Conrad and others, they said they looked up to Yugoslavia as kind of the best next thing that could happen in the real world because we were not under the Soviet uh, yoke. Uh, we had the freedom to read and to study at the universities what we wanted. You know, you could read Tocqueville or anything else. There were no constraints. So they looked up to us. 
And so their, their struggle, even though it was a full struggle for freedom, saw there was, that there was a middle step. And um, we, uh, as, as I came back to, to Yugoslavia after my studies in, in Paris in 1972, did my military service in Slovenia, as I was telling Martha and Mark a little while ago, uh, we started helping these people. Uh, Havel's plays were translated while he was in jail. Uh, they were shown in Belgrade. Uh, we translated works of, of George Konrad and Michnik. We had Polish solidarity activists come to Belgrade to talk to the students in 1980, 1981, just before the, the crackdown in December of 1981. So a lot of that, um, uh, the way that, that I kind of fashioned myself politically, and this is, of course, needless to say, thanks to my parents who were open-minded people, uh, you know, some were liberals at heart, even though my father was, was a member of, of the Communist Party, but, you know, he grew up in Europe, studied in Prague. He fought in the Spanish Civil War on the side of the Republicans, then fought in the, in the French War as he had a Czech citizenship. So the, the Czech government said, you know, when France was attacked in 1940, he should be a volunteer, so he fought with the French army and then went back to Yugoslavia in 1941 to be a partisan commander and fight the Nazis. So. It, in one way or another, it was always about the struggle for freedom. Okay. Uh, that's a fascinating story. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do now. You work for the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Uh, wh what does the group do and what's your role yeah, in it? It has a very strange name and it always beckons the long explanation. Why, why is this uh, uh, called in this way? It, it's a wonderful story, again, about freedom, about uh, the post-war era about a country defeated that is then supported by its biggest rival, the United States. So I think there was a big lesson learned after World War I and how the Allied powers treated Germany, the defeated Germany, and how then that provoked the uh, coming of Hitler to power. So there was a different tack, to put it very simply, after 1945. And so the United States uh, devised the Marshall Plan that was announced in 1947 for the reconstruction and rebuilding of Europe and principally of Germany, the country that was the biggest enemy just uh, several months before. And uh, George Marshall, who was then State Secretary, gave a speech at Harvard, um, a great speech which I would recommend you reading. It's a very short speech. It's a three, four minutes long, but it, it says a lot and very relevant today. And uh, in 1972, the 25th anniversary, uh, the Chancellor of Germany was Willy Brandt, the famous person who knelt in front of the monument to the ghetto in Warsaw and apologized for Germany's crimes. He was invited, came to Harvard, gave a, a wonderful speech, which I also recommend, but also came with a sum of money as a gift of thanks to the American people for helping them stand on their feet again and become the democratic country that they were, the Federal Republic of Germany then. And the money was for the creation of a German Marshall Fund of the United States to be an American foundation, to be based in Washington, and whose mission was to be strengthening transatlantic relations. And so we, we have a, an endowment, we're very happy to have it, and from a small foundation, uh, that basically uh, organized the fellowship, bringing Europeans to, to learn about America and then Americans to Europe, and then giving grants to other people to do think tank work. We are today a, a, a think tank hybrid, um, which uh, counts 130 people, uh, with the biggest presence of Euro in Europe of any American foundation, seven Euro uh, offices in Berlin, Warsaw, Paris, um, uh, Brussels, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Ankara. And we basically are a platform to facilitate the dialogue between the two sides of the Atlantic. And as you may know, to sort of cut to the chase, you know, Angela Merkel's cell phone was tapped uh, in the revelations of the NSA. And so my president, Karen Donfried, who rejoined us, um, she was President Obama's special advisor on Europe just until April and the director for Europe on the National Security Council and she had to deal with these things and uh, deal with the Chancellor's office and to try and explain often the unexplainable. Um, and so we uh, have a lot of work to do uh, in all of these offices in creating venues where we can discuss all of these topics and third topics, Asia for example, the rise of China, 
But then also we, and this is how I joined the German Marshall Fund, uh, an office was opened in Belgrade in 2003. Uh, it was a very novel um, project. It was a public-private partnership be between the US, US's um, ally, um, assistance development, USAID, and U German Marshall Fund put in each $10 million for 10 years, and then a private foundation from Michigan, Flint, the Mott, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, which is a car family, as you know. And so I got the task of taking these $25 million and divvying it up over 10 years to help these fledgling democratic civic initiatives throughout the 10 countries uh, of the Balkans. And it was a, a fantastic task, uh, very, in, in the most positive sense of the word, American. First of all, the US was showing initiative. This was not a European project, this was an American project. As these countries were coming out of the conflict, which ended formally with Milosevic's overthrow from power in 2000, um, that was flexible, fast moving. We could turn around a project in about two months and we were all chosen to be from the region, which was a great sign of trust and confidence. Again, I would say a very proactive American approach to things, understanding. And I saw my task, because I was now part of the German Marshall Fund, to bring in Europeans. And I was able to bring in four European governments that gave substantive funds to this 25 million. They added another 10 million euros, the Swedes, the Danes, the Dutch, the, the Czechs, the, the Greeks, when they were in a better state uh, in the early 2000s. And then private foundations, uh, the German Bosch Foundation and a big Italian foundation. And I, I really saw that as, as kind of the, the heart of the mission of, of GMF, that always had, we had to have Americans and Europeans. The Americans, as I said, were a little more uh, forceful and, and saw things earlier than Europeans. Europeans slower to move, but then eventually coming on board. And we have accomplished the first 10 years uh, last year, and we continue for another seven years with the support now of the, of the Mott Foundation and a big grant from the Norwegian government. I want to talk about uh, democracy in Eastern Europe, but I want you to, to set the context a little bit for us, if you can. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what people felt uh, in Eastern Europe at the, at the fall of the Iron Curtain. What was the feeling like? Well, it was, uh, it, you know, it's that, that the year of 89 is called the Anus Mirabilis, the, the, the year of the miracle. And it truly was a miracle. You know, I was a social scientist and, and a political scientist, and I I've worked with many uh, notable professors, experts. Nobody predicted that communism could fall so quickly. We knew it would fall eventually, as any authoritarian re regime does in the end. But nobody suspected it would happen so quickly. And of course, it required many things to come together, many stars to align. And one of them was Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the leader that he was who realized that Russia could not continue, or rather the Soviet Union could not continue the way that it did that it was losing the race, that economically all this investment into military was unviable, that the people were living badly. And, you know, he basically had to come out and say, you know, the show is over. And that the countries of Eastern Europe would not be any more dictated by from Moscow. They had to, in the famous words, uh, the Sinatra doctrine, they, it was my way. They had to choose their own way in, in going about that. And, um, and it, it simply happened. So the people were incredulous. There were many activists, of course, the ones that we mentioned, the Havels and the Michniks and the Lech Walensas and the Sakharovs in, in Russia, mm -hmm. um, you know, all the Russian dissidents. And it was all happened under the slogan then, the slogan of return to Europe because the Iron Curtain and the end, the, the division of Europe after World War II, and in particular after 1948, was seen as a terrible historical injustice. That, you know, the liberation from Nazism and fascism did not play into the hands of the countries in Eastern Europe where the Soviet Union uh, carved out its sphere of influence and the world was divided at Yalta and Potsdam in 1945. And, there we lived the period of Cold War. So there was a scramble to, one, get rid of the Soviet troops on the territories where they were. They weren't on all territories. Um, secondly, to uh, go move very quickly towards democratic elections. And the Poles were actually ahead of the time because they held their first elections before the fall of the wall in the summer. They, they were 
Uh, they were skewed elections because only, I think, a third of the parliamentary seats were free for election. The two-thirds were for the Communist Party, but still there was a massive move and Mazovetsky became the first non-communist. Um, uh, Tadeusz Mazowiecki of, of Poland became the first prime minister. And then, of course, all the events that unfolded with the opening of the border by the Hungarian leadership and letting the East German um, those who wanted to leave to the West and, and move very quickly. And, and it, did, it did move very quickly. Uh, you know, I think uh, the US and Europe uh, quickly got their act together. Um, it did take about six years for then the uh, road to open towards full European Union membership, which was very important because that gave a framework for their democratic reforms, their market reforms. And then eventually NATO enlargement happened, which wasn't obvious. I mean, those of you who know the story, there was a lot of opposition to NATO enlargement to these countries in Washington here. And there was a group of very courageous people and in the State Department, the Pentagon, one of them I work with, uh, Ron Asmus, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary. He passed away, unfortunately, a year and a half ago, working then with, with the officials. And that's how that accelerated in a good economic situation, uh, things happen. Of course, the, 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 uh, the other dimension of it is, I think, important to mention is that with the fall of the wall, three communist federations fell apart. The first one is Czechoslovakia that fell apart peacefully through what was called the Velvet Revolution. It was an elite division. The people were not asked whether they wanted to separate, but the two elites decided that they would do it. Fortunately, it's worked out. The Soviet Union broke apart more or less peacefully. There were, of course, in the Baltic countries, as we know, victims, but uh, you know, basically the, the Soviet Union turned into the Confederation of uh, Independent States. And then the most tragic story, the third communist federation was my country that fell apart in a, in a, bloody, in a bloody war and, and conflict. And uh, today it is, it is seven countries uh, out of one. Mm. Mm. What are the main, um, what would you point to as being the greatest success stories in democracy in Eastern Europe? Well, definitely the, the fact that all of these countries have uh, uh, democratic regimes um, of higher or lesser degree of quality. And uh, at dinner we, we talked about Hungary, uh, which is a very unfortunate uh, case of what's now termed as backsliding. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, Hungary has not reneged either on its membership in the EU or NATO. Uh, there's a lot of thinking about how to address this issue of, of the backsliding uh, and the curtailment of a number of uh, possibilities that the law uh, that has been changed on media, on association, uh, the uh, central bank law, these are issues that are, that are hotly discussed by experts and, and others, but um, you know, there are lots of kind of populist rhetorics these days uh, in countries like Slovakia with the prime minister there saying some, um, I actually heard from a friend just yesterday that the Slovak prime minister said that he didn't even notice the, the Velvet Revolution, uh, which, which is quite an outrageous statement for someone who, who was you know, of age in 1989. There isn't anyone who noticed the, did not notice the, the 89. But you know, so with, with those caveats, the, the greatest achievement is really that there has finally been done justice in Europe, that these countries that were supposed to be part of Europe, whole free and at peace, uh, have become part of that Europe, whole free and at peace. There is this small group of countries in the Western Balkans that are on their way now towards the European Union and towards NATO, except Serbia, although my prediction is that eventually Serbia will also join. We're talking roughly about 16 million people to really accomplish the Europe whole free and peace that uh, has been so much spoken about and that uh, really is not that much of a cost. The homework has to be done, like in the other countries. So, you know, rule of law, uh, enabling environment for your economy, um, fight corruption as best you can, and then simply be, have a government that is truly a service for its citizens, rather the opposite. And um, it is also about the credibility of Europe. If Europe cannot achieve the uh, 
unification of the continent of what I call the core geography of Europe. Nobody questions whether the Balkans are a part of Europe. Uh, you know, you, this questions start being asked when we get beyond Ukraine. Uh, if Europe cannot muster that, I don't think, you know, how can, how can it deal with other challenges in, in other parts of, of the world? But Europe is slow and uh, it is doing its work. Uh, the enlargement process is a daily job of, of what are called Eurocrats who come to work at nine o'clock and open their file on enlargement of Montenegro, Serbia, Bosnia, Macedonia, and the rest. But yeah, it is, it is really the accomplishment of freedom and the rule of law. What are the main factors, Yvonne, that, uh, that distinguish the really successful Eastern European democracies from maybe some of the less successful ones? You know, I think uh, we, 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 we put these countries together, but each country is a country of its own, with its own history, uh, with its own culture. And uh, so if we are to take a more granular look, uh, and that's what you're asking about, um, we see that uh, kind of the more uh, north and the more western you are, you know, the, the better you're doing. It's, it's a kind of a Montesquieu argument about, you know, the, the, the role of climate <laughs> in, in, in politics. Um, and uh, so I think, uh, the, the, and, and also about leadership. I mean, you know, we, we, we cannot discount the courage of someone like Havel to have taken uh, Czechoslovakia first and then the Czech Republic to, to where it is. In fact, in, in Washington we just had the celebration. There was an unveiling of a statue of Václav Havel in the U.S. Congress. Uh, there was a memorial at the, U at the cathedral. And yet today we see that the Czech president, Mr. Zeman, is being booed by um, his citizens because he is saying pro-Russian things, or rather that Russia shouldn't be under sanctions. So a lot depends on individuals beyond the society itself. But of course, individuals are elected by, by the people. So there's a trial and error in, in democracy and with elections themselves. People have not had democracy in these countries. Uh, there is uh, the Czech and Slovak lands have a a brief period in the interwar period after um, having become an independent country after the Ver Treaty of Versailles. Likewise with Yugoslavia, Serbia has a short period between 1903 and then the, the First World War and then the period in between the two wars, a very brief period. And so it's about the, the really the learning of democracy, uh, which is not easy. You know, I like to say in Serbia, we have been touched, all of these countries have been touched by the Enlightenment. I think that's another very important moment. Uh, our elites, uh, including Serbia, not only Polish and Czech and others, did travel westward, did study in Paris, did go to England and to Germany. In Serbia, we have a translation of Tocqueville's Democracy in America uh, in 1874. So just as a small example of how these elites did uh, not only lean, but really we're learning, and in the very brief introduction to this translation of two pages, there's uh, the, the, uh, the translator, someone called Nastas Petrovic, insists on the education of democracy, that the people need to have time to learn democracy. Hannah Arendt, in her book on the origins of totalitarianism, has this wonderful sentence where she says, people first need to know that they have the right to have rights. So it's about, you know, and a lot of our work as a grant maker, not only we, but USAID and other donors, uh, helping build civil society was to, to help people understand that they actually have the right to organize themselves, to ask their elected officials to be accountable, to call them on certain things, on their promises, to have, uh, we now have freedom uh, of uh, access to information laws, so you can test the government. You know, we want to see how much that trip cost of that minister. And that's why it is patchy to say, you know, who has done better than the others. Poland has definitely done well, although you remember they did have a backsliding with, by themselves when they had this, kind of the, the Kuczynski twin brothers, when that first prime minister, Mazowiecki, and all the dissidents, including, you know, Valenza and Michnik, 
wrote a letter and said, there's something going wrong here in, in Poland because you're curtailing media freedom. So I think we'll be seeing ups and downs, but if the trajectory and the commitment to being part of the Western Alliance is uh, maintained, I think we're, we're on a good course. But we need to be ready for these meanders because of the history and the legacy. Okay. Let's kind of shift to a little bit different focus. Uh, with what Russia has done in the Crimea, how, that, how has that been received in democratic Eastern Europe? Well, that's been received with, with great fear, uh, with um, apprehension, with uh, the feeling that, that uh, Russia has gone rogue in a sense, um, and that it has gone against mutually agreed values. Um, I say that, and commitments, because next year we're celebrating something uh, called uh, 40 years of the Helsinki Final Act. Again, those of you who are of our age here <laughs> will remember uh, 1975, Helsinki, 35 presidents of, of European countries, of the United States and, and Canada. Gerald Ford was uh, then there, uh, president of my country, Tito, and I think it was Brezhnev. They signed an act, and it was an act, it wasn't an agreement, where they agreed on the principles of so sovereignty and territorial integrity. There were three baskets. One was security, the other one was social and economic, and the third was human rights. It was actually inspired by Russia, who wanted to see a stabilization of relations in Europe. But then, actually, it worked for them, but it worked for liberal democratic values because of the human rights basket. So basically, they signed on the dotted line saying, you know, we need to respect what our laws and constitution says. And even the Soviet Union constitution said that there were rights for people, etc. And this was actually the springboard and the base on which the dissident movement really got a boost because the Sakharovs and Havels and Michnitz and Kurons said, you signed the Helsinki Act, and yet you are not allowing for freedom and human rights and freedom of association. And so that really was the beginning of the end, in a sense. Now, with hindsight, it's, it's more visible, but it was hard to see at that time. And so coming back to your question about Russia, Russia trampled on the Helsinki Final Act, of course, on the UN Charter and a number of other uh, international um, obligations that it, it signed up to in a, in a blatant uh, annexation of a territory of another country called Ukraine. And then, of course, uh, trying to also, nobody quite knows, uh, you know, uh, carve out a piece of territory or have influence in the eastern part of Ukraine called the Donbass, or simply to try and uh, wean away Ukraine from um, its orientation towards the European Union, which I think is impossible because the Ukrainian voters very clearly uh, gave a, a, a very strong opinion in their last election that they wanted to go towards the European Union. In fact, the president and prime minister, who are from two um, parties of European in, uh, integration, are moving in that direction. It's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue at the same time, because nobody wants war in Europe. I mean, that's where the whole idea of post Cold War uh, Europe is. That's where the whole idea of post-war Europe is. The European Union is, the, uh, is a peace project at, at first. Uh, after two centuries of Europeans mutually slaughtering each other, they finally said, you know, uh, do we need to do this every 34 years, or can French and Germans actually, you know, maybe not like each other, but live together? And today, uh, when you ask Germans, who is the country you most trust? Uh, tr who is most trustworthy, it is France. 85% of Germans think that the French are the most trustworthy. So this whole exchange of students, the Erasmus programs, the, the Franco-German reconciliation has worked wonders. And um, that is why this return to Europe was so forceful in 1989. People saw this as, as a success. Of course, it was before the economic crisis. So Europe was really growing. And that's why we in the Balkans. I was. Just anecdotally, back to my uh, biography for a second, in, in 1989, when we thought we would also be returning to Europe, not knowing what was waiting for us down the road in a year or two time, uh, I was the co-founder co -founder of something called the Democratic Forum with a number of 
uh, colleagues, uh, professionals who didn't want to go into party politics but wanted to have a political voice. So we said, well, we're going to stay in our profession, but we want to. We, we said, I remember myself saying, you know, any government that comes in will have to be criticized. There's no ideal government. So there's always something that you can correct. And I wrote the position paper on Yugoslavia's entry into the European Union for, for this small organization uh, of people. So that was the mood in, in Europe. Uh, at that time, and, and Russia was somehow seen as a country that would eventually, with all of its specificities, at least be a very close ally, if not a member, uh, even though there was talk of membership, etc. But the closeness uh, in the 90s was there, but the Russians you know, felt it differently. They felt that there was a loss of pride for the great culture and country that they are in history. And then, again, back to leadership, there was this person called Putin who was elected, and he somehow had a different view of things than Gorbachev and Yeltsin. Well, what, was, what do you feel his objective uh, was in, in getting involved in the Crimea? What was he trying to do? Well, a number of things. I think there was, uh, first of all, a, um, whether disappointment is the right word or not, when, when his man or, uh, or someone who was close to Russia, like the former Ukrainian president, uh, Yanukovych, who, when he was elected, was continuing the, the movement towards the European Union. But then, because of the, you know, very difficult economic situation, the, 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 the kind of incipient corruption that exists, the, um, the, the ties with the oligarchs, the links on energy with Russia, um, you know, Yulia Tymoshenko was put in jail for, for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, the West put that as a condition for her to be freed before they could make the move towards the European Union. Everyone was looking towards the, uh, what was the European Union summit in Vilnius last November, just over a year ago, where uh, Ukraine was supposed to sign uh, its first step towards an association agreement. And Russians and President Putin were watching all this and thinking that they had a handle at least partially on Ukraine, so that it wouldn't stray from, um, from what the Russians considered would be a security threat to them. Uh, if they had somewhat of an influence uh, in their first neighborhood, then it would be okay. But then with the demise of, of Yanukovych, the beginning of the Euromaidan movement, um, they felt they lost a grip. And I think uh, you know, most people who are much greater experts than I am on this said that there was a moment of, of you know, sudden de decision to do something like they did, the, the annexation of Crimea, uh, which um, went without victims, uh, practically. You know, it is uh, close to Russian territory, immediate. Uh, there is a, a Russian population. They sprung a quick referendum, which by you know, all counts was not <laughs> conducted in a free and fair way, to put it mildly but they pronounced it free and fair and, uh, and decided to annex it. And then, um, again, all, everyone says they didn't know that, that these were piecemeal decisions on the day or the week. Not that there weren't probably military plans. I mean, all countries plan for all sorts of things, so there must have been something like that. But I don't think this was in the cards uh, when you know, we went to the Sochi Olympics, although people said, wait for the end of the Sochi Olympics to see what will happen. Um, and I think we, we saw an unfolding. And then I would say, you know, one of the key things is that, uh, that there is a fear of loss of power on the part of President Putin. He has seen the color revolutions. They have been on record of saying that the color revolutions are the most disastrous thing that has happened. You know, they go back and invoke the, um, the invasion of Iraq. And they say, look at what Iraq is today. They talk about Libya, look at Libya today. You know, is that a country at all falling apart? Look at Syria. And then, of course, they mentioned the Orange Revolution and the others. So they, you know, there's a whole mixture of, of arguments there. Um, you know, in the West, a lot of people say, well, it's Putin has disrupted the world order. They again go back to Iraq and they say, oh, no, it's actually the, the Iraq invasion because it wasn't with the UN Security Council. Or on Kosovo, they invoke that. Also, that was the bombing that was without a UN security. So, it's, it's an argument, but having said all that, I would say that this is, you know, on European territory, a very egregious um, uh, countering and, and, uh, and um, stepping on uh, 
uh, and overturning uh, agreed laws. At, at least Europe seemed to be a place where one could unfold in a normal way international relations. And even though there were disagreements that somehow we could find a language uh, and, and that, that went astray. Is there any reason that Americans should worry that there might be some new kind of a second reduced Cold War? Is that, or is that not possible in today's world? My opinion is, is not. You know, some people talk about a third, Cold, a third world war with all the wars that are going on. I think these are, these are um, you know, uh, this is hyperbole in a sense. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that to say that the situation is easy. On the contrary, I think we're, we're, we're confronted with a huge challenge. Uh, the U.S. is in a somewhat more favorable position economically because there aren't so many investments, American investments in Russia. Uh, Europe has invested, you know, if I can make the comparison, if it's possible at all to make these kind of analogies, a kind of a Marshall Plan for Russia in, in terms of private investments. Uh, Germany is heavily invested in industries and technology. Uh, you know, food exports are enormous uh, to Russia with the idea of bringing Russia closer into the fold. Yeah, they can stay what they are, but you know, through, the, through globalization, through commerce and trade, you know, let's, let's try and live a peaceful life on the European continent. And so um, the fact that Russia has done this, that uh, everybody has been you know, caught flat-footed, uh, Europe has taken, I would say, very courageous steps with escalating the, the sanctions, you know, in the U.S. together with Europe, first, second, and now third tier of sanctions, adding new names, adding new companies. Everybody towing the line, including a country like Hungary or Slovakia, even Montenegro, a candidate to the European Union and NATO, has joined the sanctions. Um, means, and, and the latest polls that I was looking at in Germany, the Germans are very strongly backing Angela Merkel in her tough stance towards Russia. So people uh, really are fearful. I personally think that, that the, you know, President Putin and the Russians will not touch any NATO country because that triggers Article 5 and, you know, we, we defend uh, each one of ourselves uh, if one is attacked. Uh, but it doesn't diminish the, uh, the complication of, you know, how, how does one handle Ukraine? And just one sentence of that, and we talked about that at dinner, I think the key thing is to prop up Ukraine uh, in a very difficult economic situation because Ukraine cannot fail. I mean, if we're serious about stability and security in Europe. Okay. I only have one more question, then we're going to open it up to questions and answers from the audience. So be thinking about what questions that you might want to, uh, to ask this evening. But, but I, want, I kind of want to get, uh, Yvonne, your thoughts for Americans. I mean, in our country, we think maybe people don't participate enough. They, they maybe take democracy for granted. Uh, what can you tell them uh, from the perspective of Eastern European democracy and from what it was actually like to live under communism? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a huge question, uh, Bill. And um, I, <laughs> you know, as a political scientist, I, I obviously studied the American system a lot and always was baffled, as, especially as a younger, as a student, that there was such low turnout, I mean, compared to Europe, even in US presidential elections. And then, you know, talking to professors, et cetera, I realized that there, there was a, a kind of a confidence in the system and that those who did not vote in the election, presidential or other, knew that basically the system wouldn't change fundamentally. And thus, you know, if you were very politically engaged, yeah, you were, you know, you're a Democrat or Republican or independent. But for those who weren't, you know, interested in this, they knew that if it was one or the other, you know, America would still be rule of law, it would be still capitalism, you'd be still free entrepreneurship, you could still study at a state university for a lower cost than a private university. And so I, I, I understood that there, the long history of democracy of 200 years of constitution, etc., gave a trust and a confidence in the system. But, you know, one has to be wary of that because things can go astray and that, that's the lesson and the, 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 the text that I always refer to there is, is the, from the French liberal philosopher Benjamin Constant, where he talks, uh, the, his essay on the liberty of the ancients and the moderns, where he says, you know, 
In the ancient world, you had to be an engaged person to be a citizen. In the modern world, to be a citizen, you don't have to be engaged in politics and public affairs. You can go about tending your own garden and going your own business. But the punchline of the essay is, but you know, we shouldn't just take that lightly because power always has a tendency of alienating itself or you know, becoming self-absorbed and doing things that actually we didn't want them to do as we elected them. So I think that applies here. Um, in communism, very simply, there was no democracy, no freedom. Uh, the system atomized individuals. They were not allowed to congregate. Um, they could, you know, consumerism was allowed. You could, uh, in, in my country, Yugoslavia was the prime example of this, you know, that we had huge freedoms, but you couldn't contest the monopoly of the Communist Party. You couldn't organize a party. You couldn't speak up freely against the president or the Communist Party. That would land you in jail. Um, I was very engaged uh, since the 80s, uh, but you know, we didn't want to land ourselves in jail, so we found ways. We wrote petitions for greater freedoms. The regime didn't see this as dangerous, but we started speaking up because we felt that you know, this, this was not right. And we defended people who were sent to jail. Uh, we wrote petitions for them. We helped them uh, in a variety of ways. And then we supported, as I mentioned, this was another way of telling our regime what we thought by supporting solidarity in Poland, by supporting Havel, the artists, the theaters. You know, this was a way of saying, this is what we want. These are the people who, whom we respect. So it was, so if that was in a country like Yugoslavia that was call it soft totalitarianism or you know, authoritarianism, as you went behind the Iron Curtain, it was just disastrous. I mean, people had absolutely no, no political freedom. You really stuck your neck out and people landed in jail, like all the people whom we mentioned. And so, um, you know, I, when I taught political science and political history and political theory, I always told my students, you know, all the freedoms that we have the, the you know, universal suffrage, the eight-hour working week, you know, social or political, these were all fought in the streets of Europe and America. This was not given on a silver plate. People had to go out and fight for all of these things. And, some, and very often people died in the streets to get these freedoms. You know, just look at women's vote, how long it took for that. But let alone all the other votes for freedom of association, of pluralism, of speaking out. So, I think we need to remind ourselves and, and those who are coming, generations who are coming after us, that democracy is not a given. It has to be reinvented every day, literally, because of, of human nature. And again, the Federalist Papers talk about this. You know, you take any serious uh, political theorist from the 17th, 18th century onwards, you know, Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, uh, they're all or, or the British Enlightenment, the, the John Locke's and, and Adam Smith, they, they talk about this. But I think if, um, if one has lived in peace for a very long time, if one has had a democracy for a very long time, there's a tendency to forget how important these values and these laws are. Because there might come a time, and this is the, the hardest lesson that I had to learn in my country because in my country, you also learned that we must never repeat the Second World War, that the Holocaust must never happen. We had concentration camps by the Nazis in, in our country. We visited as children, as school children. We saw the movies about this. And I literally, until the, the day the war began in my country, I didn't believe it was going to happen. So it is the hardest lesson for a human being to know that history can be repeated but, uh, in the worst possible way. And that's what we somehow have to create the condition for people to be able to have antennas to recognize when things are going astray. Okay. Uh, we'll take Q&A now. If you'll wait, we'll have uh, one of our gentlemen here, our student workers, come by. And we've got two right here together. So. Um, I was wondering about migration. Uh, in Western Europe, Eastern Europeans were looked down upon, and then the Turks, and now people from Africa and Asia. And I was wondering, is there, can there be a system to help uh, those people be welcomed and put into society? <laughs> 
Uh, absolutely. Thank you for that question. It's, it's, a, it's a very big question. Of course, all our societies, and America is a prime example, that uh, you know, the, these countries thrive because people come from afar uh, to, to work in these countries. Um, the, the economic situation in Europe is, uh, is particularly uh, bad because of the high levels of unemployment, especially in southern Europe, Greece, Italy, that are the recipient countries. And the European Union is uh, you know, making great efforts to try and address this issue. Uh, Italy, um, as you know, has been the recipient of a lot of the migrants coming from Africa, from deep Africa through North Africa. And um, there's been somewhat of a lack of solidarity, if I can put it that way, from other European countries, given that this is a union. And the Italians have said now, you know, we'll stop our humanitarian action in the Mediterranean Sea because nobody else is pitching in here. You know, folk come, come forward and, and help us in this. Similarly in Greece, that is, you know, on that frontier with, with Turkey where a lot of people from Asia, Afghanis and others are, are coming. Um, and uh, Greece being a European Union country is also asking, asking for help. Uh, the situation is far from ideal. Um, and uh, the, the plight of, of a lot of these people, Syrians now in particular, that are coming across other borders into Bulgaria and, and Romania, is particularly uh, difficult. Uh, Europe will need uh, all of these people because there's a declining demographic situation generally, uh, except in some countries, not in France, for example, but in Germany. My country is one of the worst off demographically. I mean, we're losing thousands of citizens every decade. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there will have to be a more concerted approach on this issue. Uh, whether that will happen tomorrow or not, that, that's a different question. But I think the European Union is very aware of this. Okay, we have another question, right? Uh, my question is related to the previous question. I actually have two questions. So my first one is as follows. I absolutely agree with you that a lot of what has been done by Russia internationally can be best understood through uh, the lens of its domestic politics. So Putin government needs legitimacy, and uh, it's been building legitimacy through the Rossiyski nationalism, uh, with its, its appeals to traditional values and morality and family values. So my question is, um, although Russia claims to be unique with its culture and traditions and morality, the government also tries to reach out to the conservatives conservative uh, layers of the population in Europe, particularly those who are against the immigrants coming from East and Central Europe or from other parts of the world. So you cited some polls suggesting that some population is supporting the government, but what Putin is trying to present is that the governments of the European states actually forsaken all those traditional values and morality and family values and appealing to those conservatives who don't want to see any more um, immigrants and migrants, who don't want to you know, be involved anywhere, but just you know, mind your own business. So I wonder if you can speak to whether or not that narrative that Putin and his government has, you know, have prepared uh, speak to those conservatives, conservative um, uh, uh, populations in, in the European states. Um, and my second question is with regard to your comment that you made about learning about human rights or educating yeah, about yeah. human rights. And I'm, so I grew up in the Soviet Union and I studied law and I studied human rights and I wrote my, my thesis on the Council of Europe and I teach human rights and I've done research on human rights in Central Asia. And I've come to the conclusion that you can't teach human rights. You can't not educate about human rights. You can only experience them you have to live in democracy and in human rights, respectful environment. Then you get a grasp on, you kind of, you internalize them, you feel them, become a part of you. So I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit more about on whether you can teach, you can educate on human rights. No, th thank you very much, Maria, for that question. I'll start with the second one. You're absolutely right. It's, you, you can't teach human rights. Of course, we teach them and we educate and you need to have, uh, well, a body of law and then call upon cases and demonstrate to people how, how this is done, but it can only be, be lived. And that's why civil society is so important, that you know, this is where things begin, uh, where some, a group of small people organize themselves and then you know, from very uh, 
so-called simple things, you know, cleaning up the environment around your condo building or, you know, helping uh, a child whose mother is ill, you know, reaching a simple human solidarity and then kind of expanding it to the, the rights of others who are different from us or perceived as different to, to help people understand that we're all human beings that are born equal and that we need to have the, the same conditions uh, to move forward. So um, that is why it takes time. And that is, you know, as we are all impatient to become full-fledged democracies, it doesn't happen overnight. And uh, a Hungarian sociologist uh, who used this, you know, Latin annus mirabilis, the year of the miracle, wonderfully said that, you know, because there were such huge expectations that we all had in 89 that, you know, suddenly the the facade of totalitarianism crumbles and behind it is uh, uh, Athena out of Zeus's head, you know, this brilliant democracy. <laughs> uh, he said then, uh, the, he said the, the second year is the annus desillusionis, then there's the annus miserabilis, and then, you know, so it's learning that, that society is a complicated thing, an animal, and, you know, as, a, as somebody who studied France and the French Revolution, it took France roughly 100 years to really stabilize itself in 1870 under the Third Republic after the Paris Commune. And, yeah, it's, it's easier said than, than to live it. <laughs> and hopefully, and, and the other quote that I always have is Ralph Darendorf, of course, in his book on the revolutions of 89 that he wrote, kind of following Edmund Burke's model of the revolution. Um, he said, you know, you can change your constitution to make it democratic in about six months. You could probably turn your economy around for six years from a command economy into a capitalist economy. And then maybe with a bit of exaggeration, he said, but it, it takes about 60 years to have a full-fledged civil, democratic civil society. And I hope we can shorten that. And I think we have in a number of countries, back to your question, on, you know, what are the, the quality of the democracies in Eastern Europe? Um, but it needs work. It needs work. You know, somebody has to get up to think about this all the time. As other people get entrepreneurial, start their small businesses, you know, teach children, etc. Um, and that's why leadership again is important to keep kind of the, the compass forward and stave off corruption. To your first question, uh, you know, the the Russians and President Putin are looking for allies in in Western Europe. I mean, they just gave. Marine Le Pen, uh, a Russian bank, gave her 9 million euros, the Sberbank. Um, they, I think, are trying to influence a lot of right-wing movements uh, appealing to these family values and uh, traditional conservative values to traditional Christianity as they see it that is now being buffeted around as, again, they, they consider uh, what is happening in, in the rest of the world with, with gay rights, with, with gay marriage, all of these things. So he's trying to find all those, uh, call them soft places, where um, uh, these people who are right-wing, like Marine Le Pen, which frankly, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that someone who's born and lived and grown up in France can say that, you know, Putin is a great, great kind of leader, uh, just because he, he seems, uh, you know, hard-nosed and kind of tough and and move it. And th there are several other uh, movements. Uh, you know, there's the Jobbik movement in Hungary, uh, in Bulgaria, there's Ataka. Uh, so, you know, no, no country is devoid or immune to, to these kind of right wing, um, anti immigrant, uh, anti democratic uh, people. And uh, I think it, it's again incumbent upon the mainstream parties and civil society to, to counter uh, every day, uh, you know, in the media, uh, in the public sphere, uh, these outrageous things that they're saying. Okay, we have a question right here. I have a question that was bothering me for quite some time. You mentioned Article 5, NATO, nobody will touch any member. Yeah. But what we see today, hybrid war, irregular war, nonlinear war, war but which is not really a war, what constitutes attack? The argument with these non-traditional methods might be, might be that some actions against some country, be it Little Estonia or some other country, with uh, cyber or non-traditional 
does not constitute attack in the meaning that when the charter was drawn. So instead, member countries might start a debate saying, does it constitute an attack or not? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. It's a very important and uh, obviously prominent one. Uh, I think a lot of people, well, a lot of people, a lot of countries were caught flat-footed by this hybrid, uh, very sophisticated nature. We, we have a big conference um, that the German Marshall Funds organizes in, um, in Brussels every year in March, and we had General Breedlove uh, at our conference just this March, and he, from a military standpoint, he said, you know, leaving aside the whole values issue that the, the operation in Crimea and all of this was executed to, to perfection. And then when you add on all of these other things that you mentioned, the, the cyber dimension, the propaganda dimension that's obviously been thought of through very carefully, is only now in the past month and beginning to be counteracted upon. Um, you know, the, the, the so-called so soft power that Russia is deploying now with itself opening its voice of Americas, its Ru voice of Russia's in these various countries, uh, the Russia Today TV station, um, you know, putting articles by people who are sympathetic to them um, is obviously something that has to be taken very, very seriously. Um, again, I return to the, to the difficult economic situation when people are unemployed when they're seeking, you know, whom to blame uh, for what is happening to them, and when somebody feeds them uh, simplistic populist arguments, they are easy to catch upon that, and they will try to overthrow their incumbent mainstream parties. We, we're seeing this in different places. Not that this is all the work of Russia. I mean, people are simply unhappy with the way that, uh, you know, they have lost jobs. They've seen deindustrialization of these countries. Um, but I still think that um, you know the 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 incursions of, of Russian military aircraft, the supposed submarine uh, in the Stockholm um, Bay, uh, these are all things that are testing the metal of uh, you know the countries of NATO um, and seeing you know what the response will be. Uh, it is it is. Uh, disastrous. I mean, it's not helping the, the global security situation. And at the same time, you know, they're talking because, um, because of Russia's economic situation, as we mentioned. Um, it, it has to, you know, if it's serious about itself, because itself it has a declining demographics, a very dramatic decline in demographics. And then when you look at the at the big numbers, the, the economy of the United States is roughly $17 trillion. The economy, the GDP of the European Union is roughly the same, $17 trillion. Russia is $2 trillion. So just to give you a sense of magnitude and who's, who's who in this whole story. So yeah, there can be grandstanding, there can be big tactical victories or even serious kind of like the Crimea. But one wonders, you know, who's thinking strategy and sort of even midterm, I wouldn't even say long term, about what, what will Russia live off if it doesn't have this economic and trade connection. Yes, there's China and there's the, the deal on the gas there. But, you know, China and Russia have never been cozied up to each other. So um, I think there's a lot of worry also about <laughs> a demographic expansion, which is somewhat happening by, by Chinese in, into those huge and vast territories of Siberia. So again, you're, you're very right to raise that question. I think a lot of people are um, you know, mulling and, and working on, on that because it is something that will have to be you know, addressed in the immediate and, and near future if, if we are to counter that type of hybrid warfare. Okay, I have a question here. <coughs> Uh, thanks for coming. Um, there has been some comment that uh, the Russian people, particularly, I guess, those in, in the older age groups, aren't comfortable with a more free and open form of government and that they really feel better about uh, a more autocratic uh, system. Could you comment on that? Yeah. Uh, well, that, I, would, I would put that under the rubric of nostalgia, <laughs> you know, for, for 
for more certain times. I mean, there was a certainty to life in, in these regimes, you know. Uh, there are all sorts of adages, as you know, we pretend to work, they pretend to pay us. Uh, but it, it, there was so-called 100% employment. Um, you know, people had the, the basics, uh, had a roof uh, over their heads, and uh, there was a sort of a resilience uh, to to life. And uh, because of the the great you know suffering during the, the Second World War, uh, and and the authoritarian nature of, of of the regime, and then there is a difference, you know. Soviet Union was 70 years under communism. We were only 45 years, and that, that, those, that difference of 25 years makes a big difference uh, in, in habits of the heart, to use Tuckwell's words again. And so I think it's, it's more nostalgia in that the arrival of democracy and capitalism has disrupted that kind of orderly life where people knew you know, whom you had to bow to and you know what you could do and what you couldn't do even though there wasn't all the kind of variety in the supermarkets and so democracy is a demanding system it, it requires individual engagement you know it, it, you cannot simply wait for the state to do everything for you and that's what what people have been used to you know the state worries about all of that and we just kind of uh, you know, we live our lives and we go to school, it's state, paid by the state, and then we'll get a job and hopefully, you know, we'll have the job. And people had jobs for their whole lives. And so now the fact that there's been this disruption has uh, created uh, a sense of frustration, particularly with the older generation. I think they, they long for that calmer, what they perceive as, as being calm. It's a false calm, of course, because it's, it's an authoritarian or totalitarian calm. And that's why the need to stabilize democracy and the economy is, is so paramount. And uh, the global economic crisis has not helped that because there's been a, uh, a lack of investment in these countries. Um, and now I'm talking about the countries of East and Central Europe where there's not enough domestic capital to kickstart these economies. So we're all very dependent on foreign direct investments. And the way that you get them is to reform yourself, is to you know, create a one-stop shop for opening a, a firm for, um, you know, not everybody uh, asking you to pay bribes along the way as you open your thing. Uh, these, these are things that don't happen overnight because there are still a lot of vested interests. There's been these pri rogue privatizations. You know, how does someone become at 30 years of age in any of these countries, you know, billionaire? Overnight. Well, because they had insider knowledge with the old secret services, they knew which companies were, you know, being downsized and could be bought for nothing. And of course, you would fill the pocket of the bureaucrat whom gave you the information. And so those old networks, you know, the, the adage there was the political losers become the economic winners. Uh, so a lot of that happened uh, in the transition. Uh, and uh, people are thus then um, in a kind of path of least resistance, tempted to go back and say it was better uh, in the old days. Okay, we're gonna take uh, two more questions. We have our first one here. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation on the situation in Europe. Thank you. I wanna come back to the question of China. Okay. Because while we talk about hybrid warfare and we're doing the Russian bears flying around and all of that, there's one event that seems to have disappeared from Western talk, and it is the movement of chemical weapons out of Syria to Italy, and the fact that four, com four countries escorted those, a Dane, a Norwegian, a Chinese, and a Russian warship. And the Russian warship was the capital. It was the Peter Veliki, and the Chinese frigate that was brought in came off the, the uh, escort duty down in Somalia against the anti-piracy. But those two, the Russian and the Chinese, were for about six months conducting joint operations. This was, un these were actual real operations being conducted in a place that was highly politically sensitive and it reflected a very common policy by Russia and China on the question in Syria. So I'm, I'm asking you the question, when we look at, for instance, Ukraine, a Russian will tell you it's a Eurasian crisis, and they'll look east and say, and the Chinese have a voice, not as loud as ours, but a voice. And we tend to say it's 
all about essentially European crisis and the question of whether Ukraine goes to the West and goes into a European organization. How do you see the Chinese, in fact, playing in this equation, given their level of cooperation, precisely in areas where clearly there's a security dimension to it, and clearly they are very close mm -hmm. to the Russians? That, that's a, a, a very important and a very big question. And, and China, obviously, being the, the big country and the great civilization that it is, is kind of concerning every move very, very carefully. Um, I don't know the specifics about the um, Syrian uh, issue, but uh, when you mentioned the, the Chinese vessel, I, I had the chance to talk to a, to a Dutch admiral who was on one of the Dutch ships in the Somali Straits, and uh, he mentioned the Chinese, and I said, so how was it to cooperate with them? He said it was the best cooperation that they ever had. The Chinese were very serious about fighting piracy because you know, their trade depends on these maritime routes. So, on the one hand, they're building up their navy just so that they can also secure their maritime routes if something goes wrong with Western navies. But then, obviously, they're building up their military capacity. And who knows what, what they want with their now stealth fighter, et cetera. But I think that um, you know, the fact that, um, and th this may be not directly relevant, but I think it is that the fact that President Obama and Xi Jinping reached this agreement on climate issues just recently is an indication of the fact that they realize how locked in they are into the world. And you, you, know, you may not agree with the specifics of the agreement, et cetera, but they know that they are doing themselves wrong by all the pollution that they're doing. That They'll probably die out of all the coal that's in their air if they don't themselves address it. But they know it's a, it's a kind of global commons issue. So I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, complexity to the way that China is rising. You know, the fact that their GDP has now fallen to 7%. I remember an economist friend who traveled there six years ago, and he said, so what did you come back with? He said, they're in a panic if GDP falls below 10%. And so it's fallen down to 7%. And Xi Jinping is fighting corruption because as everywhere, and there in particular, I mean, there is these very egregious cases. It is a country of the magnitude that it is. They, I think, sense that eventually democracy will have to come, be, as it did with the fall of communism. But you know, it might happen tomorrow. It might happen in 100 years in China. Who knows? I mean, the dynamics of, of that society. It's opened up enormously. I mean, you know, you look around. Made in China is everywhere. You know, our iPhones and iPads come from there. So I think that the Chinese in that regard, um, I would say, are more prudent than, than Russia is at this moment. At least that's the way I personally see it. They're, they're more cautious about the way they're handling their strength and their kind of muscle. Um, but, and then, of course, the way they, they made this agreement with, with the Russia on gas is very interesting. I mean, they, they are you know, sucking up whatever they can in terms of energy, in terms of minerals, you know, their investments in Africa are incomparable to anything that anyone else is doing. And again, we, we you know, one, we have to be cautious and kind of have a watchful eye uh, on them and then be talking to them because we, we do depend economically so much and that means in security terms also. Okay, we have time for one final question right over here. All right, uh, so my question is kind of geared as, you know, being a student and part of that younger generation. So I'm right on that cusp of, you know, 93, 91. So I'm wondering about what types of differences in experience between my generation and my peers in Eastern Europe will have as they assume leadership. So what's beneficial and detrimental from our experiences without communism um, and yours? Well, the first thing, the, the people, the, 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 your peers in Eastern Europe don't know about communism either because if they were born, you know, in whatever, 1987 or 86, they were three years old. So they have no recollection like, like you don't. And that, I think that's an interesting, and that's why peerdom is, is interesting. And um, they have, you know, they have, you know, spread their wings and they're, they're flying. I mean, many of them are studying in, in this country, in, in Europe, those who have joined the European Union are benefiting from the exchange programs. They can study anywhere in Europe they want through the Erasmus program. Um, but obviously, because of the, uh, the various challenges that we mentioned um, uh, in terms of social conservatism, uh, 
um, you know, many have decided to, to work and stay abroad because there simply is no work, which unfortunately is the case with Spaniards and Italians who are going to Germany or to Denmark and Norway to find jobs, uh, you know, computer science uh, experts or, or doctors or others. So there has been a brain drain. That has been a, a difference, I must say, uh, between uh, your generation here and, and those in Eastern Europe who have not, unfortunately, been able to stay at home, even though, you know, who would leave home if, if they weren't obliged to for finding and, and having a living? Um, the, the, the fortunate thing is that the continent is small, so they can go backwards and forwards. Um, but uh, again, it will be incumbent upon the, the leaderships of these countries to see to it that they can actually help resolve uh, the future of this country by creating uh, a, a it, there's no other word, simply rule of law and an uh, economic um, uh, legal environment that can attract uh, investors to come there. And it doesn't have to be a car factory, I mean, because these are all small countries, but there are ways in which small and medium-sized enterprises can cater to bigger European economies. Germany is looking for that now, for example. They're, they're going around the regions <coughs> and looking for this because they, they, their industries need this, this kind of input. But I would say in terms of values, the, 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 you look at opinion polls, you know, Eurobarometer, for those of you who want to follow this, the, the European Union does a regular poll every month. Uh, you see that the values have changed from, from those earlier generations. And these are really generations now that are uh, brought and, and believe in, in the, the, the corpus of, of liberal democracy. Ivan, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you. Great pleasure.